talking about kamatana, meditation methods to bring the mind to stillness and peace. Um, that some of these we can use our wisdom to contemplate in order to do that. And so there's the ahare, patikula, sanya, um, the bringing up the perception of food as something which is disgusting or unclean. So we can contemplate where this food comes from, so the fruit and the vegetables, that these grow from the ground and we need to put some fertilizer into the ground. And the plants, vegetables, the fruit, that's where they get their nutriment from and the minerals they need. This comes from the soil, and the soil is something unclean, something disgusting. And then the food that has meat in it, all different kinds of meat, well this is filled with blood. It's something that has kind of an unclean smell to it as well. And so we need to cook this meat well uh, to get rid of that smell of uncleanliness. So we should contemplate all the food that we eat in this way, and that these are unclean things. And then the mind will grow weary of it and uh, dispel any delight or lust that it has and able to come to peace. And so this is one meditation object that we can use. So when we've contemplated the food already, then we see how <coughs> this body was able to grow due to the food that we put into it. And therefore this body too is something which is unclean. No matter how good the food may be, when we put it into the body, once it enters the mouth, it loses all its value. So we should contemplate like this in order to cut away any delight that we may have towards food. We can also contemplate the elements as well, the earth, water, the fire, the air, that comprise this body. And so we separate <clears throat> those elements out and see this body as it falls apart, disintegrates. And something which is very difficult to disintegrate, and a part of this body which only decays with difficulty, is the bones. And they go from initially being white into being, being brown and then blackened. And so there was one rains retreat. I went to Lopuri province and I contemplated very frequently a skeleton that was there in the monastery. There was one elderly monk who had passed away and he gave his body and his skeleton as an offering for the cultivation of insight. So as I looked at his skeleton, then uh, I could keep that image clearly with me in my mind <clears throat> and then contemplate this body as just being a heap of elements, just a heap of earth. And when I did this, the mind was in a state of peace as well. And so if our minds are calm, then the contemplation is easy. But whatever the case, we need to put in our energy and our effort constantly into this. And as we do that, then one day peace will arise. So therefore, with our contemplation, this is something that we can uh, do constantly. And we should always try to have mindfulness with us. So standing, walking, sitting, lying down, we should try to be very mindful, reciting Buddha or Dhammo or Sangho, or we can recite Kesa Loma Naka Danta Tacho, 
hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. So we need one of these meditation phrases or words to recite in our hearts in order to compete against all of the emotions and sense impressions which come up. So for example, the emotions towards the things that we find desirable. And if the mind is in a state of peace, then we'll be able to contemplate those things and understand them. If the mind is peaceful, we'll understand that this is the right way of practice, that this is correct. This path of practice of the mind, which isn't involved in liking or disliking, towards any of these sense impressions. So we should contemplate this, and this is something that we need to train ourselves in as well. It's not that the mind will just go that way naturally on, of its own accord. We need to train it to do so. In order for it to reduce its delusion towards all of the senses, the sensory experiences that it comes upon. So in this path of practice, we should know a sense of enoughness with regards to what we eat, and also with our sleep and our speech as well. So just to speak little, to eat little, to sleep little, to awaken ourselves with effort. And this is even more so for monks and novices, those who wear the robes uh, of a Buddhist monk, which are the victory banner of the Arahant. And we have a very good opportunity to be composed and restrained. We're able to speak just a little amount, or sometimes we can try out going without speaking at all. And just to eat a little bit, that if the mind is very scattered, then we should eat just a small amount. If there's a lot of food that we eat, then there can be a lot of desire and liking in the mind, and this causes the mind to be scattered and restless. But if we compose ourselves and restrain ourselves well, then the mind can settle into peace. So we need to have a lot of mindfulness, and this is even more so while we're eating. We need to try to keep our mind there so that it comes into peace. And we need a meditation object to do that. So one of the objects that we can use as monastics is that of this bringing up this perception of the filthy nature of food, or of the 32 parts of the body, or the four elements, that all of these are meditation objects that we can use. And we can use these in all the various postures that our body takes. And when we're listening, we can be reciting Buddha in our hearts as well. To have mindfulness, trying to keep our mind there present. So if the mind settles into a state of peace, then we'll be able to see all of the movements of the body and how these movements and the body are not me. The mind can see that it's merely a body. And so this feeling arises, and we need to try to train ourselves so that this feeling comes up within ourselves, that it's merely a body. It's not a being, not an individual, not self, not other. And here is where we will see the Dhamma. But before we get to that point, then when we sit in meditation, samadhi arises, joy comes up. And this happens more and more frequently, that each day we can feel this. And there's an energy that imbues the heart. So this is coming to the point of the bojangas, so the factors for awakening, those which bring us to knowing the Dhamma. 
And we get great energy to our sitting and walking practice, that we don't become weary with it, we don't become tired of chanting. We don't become bored of keeping the schedule and standards of the monastery, but our hearts feel contentment and happiness in doing this that there's this joy that comes up, and this is merit in the hearts. This is Bharami, the spiritual perfections that we are creating. And so the heart comes into this point of stillness and peace. And when it's still and peaceful already, then the mind will be able to understand clearly how the mind is one thing, and all of the things that arise within it are something else. And that the two separate out. But before that, whenever things arose within the mind, whenever there were these uh, sense impressions, then the mind would run following after them. And it would become intertwined with those sense impressions. And then when that sense impression uh, fades, the mind becomes free for a period of time. But then another sense impression arises and the mind runs after it all over again. So therefore we need to be composed, collected, and to try to reduce the things that we experience through our eyes, our ears, our nose, the tongue, the body to try to reduce the thoughts in the mind, so that they're just a little. So the mind can settle into stillness and samadhi. And so we see here that this is the path, the practice. And we won't have any doubts about that. But if the mind isn't still, then it has doubts. It will be chaotic and we won't be able, feel like we won't be able to find the path. It's like a pond that's covered over with weeds. And then our great teacher, he gives a discourse on the nature of samadhi and on contemplation, seeing how there isn't any true self. And then clarity and joy can arise within the mind. And this stream of dhamma purifies the mind so that we can see into anicca, dukkha, anatta, this inconstancy or change and suffering, not self, see into emptiness. But this is something that we need to train ourselves in as well. Because we have a goal, and in the beginning the mind is quite chaotic, it has a lot of thoughts, it's very restless. And when it won't just stop thinking carries on going and going, then we need to chant a lot. We just need to carry on practicing until we get there. And it's not above our efforts. It's something that we can do. And wherever effort is, then success is to be found there. But it's normal that in our practice, in the beginning, then we fall down and we pick ourselves up and we crawl along. And we need to endure a lot. But as we carry on going, then we feel a coolness in our hearts. There's calm and stillness and peace. So before we thought that in order to gain the stillness of samadhi, then we need to sit in meditation to do that. Or we need to do long periods of walking meditation for this to arise. But as we carry on, then that peace stays with us, even when we're eating, even going on arms round, when we're sweeping. There's the stillness and calmness and coolness. And we see that, ah, that the suffering that I'm experiencing is steadily reducing. The greed, hatred and delusion is steadily reducing. That before, when I met with something that I didn't like, then anger would come up very easily, but now that's getting less and less. Able to see how the mind is one thing and its objects are something else. And before we thought that I am this anger, this anger is me. 
But in truth, it's just an object of the mind. It's just an aramana. It's just something that appears and something that we know for what it is in time. So in the beginning, we sit and there's peace there. And then as we go on, then that peace pervades through all of the postures that the body takes. And it can stay for a month and then many, many months. And when it's in that state, then when we really do go to sit in meditation, then the peace and the stillness becomes even more profound. And it's easy to contemplate the body and see it as being something unattractive, and that's very obvious, that insight. See how the body, it's just full of blood and pus and urine. It's a bag of feces, a bag of bones. And we see that clearly. And when it's clear, then this joy arises. There's a stillness there in the heart. And that we become weary with these bodies and the lust for them goes. And then when we contemplate again, we contemplate this body as being a heap of earth, water, fire and air, and then contemplate that again, and then we can reach emptiness. And so here this emptiness arises, and we can see emptiness. And it's like the mind will leave this world and go to another world. And it, tra- it will transcend this world. And we're beginning to see here how the body, it truly is anatta. It's truly not self. And before there was a clarity to this insight, but then that becomes clearer and clearer. And then the samadhi that arises is even stronger than it was before. The wisdom is even better than it was before. And even though we start to attach again, we have that samadhi there to protect the mind so that it doesn't become scattered. So when this happens, we see that this practice, it really does bear fruit. And then effort arises of its own accord. It's not something that we need to control or force ourselves to do. Because the mind really wants to experience freedom from suffering. And so sila, samadhi and panya, these all come together. And we see a Buddha there in the hearts. And the heart changes little by little. It's like we have many strands of rope which are binding our hearts. And as we cut each of those strands, then there's a feeling of spaciousness and freedom there in the heart. And the thing which binds our hearts is the sense of self. But when the path comes together, in harmony, then we see clearly. And we see that the practice is like this, and it truly does give rise to results. So therefore, as monastics, we've got a very good opportunity to practice. And for the laity, we also have a good opportunity to practice. You can keep the five precepts, the eight precepts. And as you carry on, one day, there will be this clear understanding and knowing of the Dhamma. And then from there, uh, the practice just develops by itself. It's not something that's difficult. It becomes much easier. There aren't any doubts at that point. All there is is progress, just moving forward. So may you set your heart on this. <laughs>